Our next speaker is Professor William Muma. He is Emeritus Professor of International Environmental Policy and Founding Director of the Center for International Environment and Resource Policy at the Fletcher School, Tufts University. Professor Muma is also a Resource Professor of Chemical and Biological Engineering, and he is the co-director of the Global Development and Environmental Institute at Tufts University and Chief Science Officer at Earthwatch Institute. He was lead author of three intergovernmental panel on climate change reports and was the coordinating lead author of two more, including the special report on renewable energy and climate change. He has also, of course, published multiple articles on the science and policy of climate change. Bill. Thank you. I, I'm going to just make a few uh, comments of, of a more general nature about uh, uh, scientific research on, on the, in the Arctic and uh, the need for cooperation. Um, obviously, we first need the, to have research that is local to the Arctic. What's actually happening in the Arctic? And we're getting an increasingly um, refined picture of that, as we've heard through multiple presentations <clears throat> here at the uh, Arctic Circle Assembly. Uh, realization yesterday in one of the breakout sections that, sessions that, remember, there are multiple Arctics. There's the Boreal Arctic, there's the Tundra Arctic, there's the Arctic Sea, there's the Frozen Arctic. There are just all kinds of different parts of the Arctic, and so there's a lot of, of, of area to cover. But it's very easy for those of us from the mid-latitudes and the tropics to look at change in the Arctic as something that's happening there and not affecting us. For example, I know a lot of people who said, isn't it great that the ozone hole happened over Antarctica instead of over me, right? <laughs> it's away, it's someplace else. Uh, the same in the Arctic. Uh, the sea ice is melting in the Arctic. Well, that doesn't affect me, but of course it does. And so the second component of the research programs has to be uh, the global implications and here we need to think about two aspects. Much of the research that's been done to date has been initiated by the scientific community, uh, mostly out of, I would say, curiosity-driven science. I, by the way, am a, am a chemist, and, uh, and, and I, I, for 25 years I did curiosity-driven science, and it was great fun, and I really loved doing it. But in addition to curiosity-driven science, because that's where the innovation often comes from, we also need directed science in order to make sure that we are addressing the very issues and questions that we need. So obviously our monitoring, our measuring, our modeling all have need, need to have a, a, an applied focus to understanding what's happening so that we can develop the strategies and the, pro, and, and the um, policies uh, that will help us address climate change so we can know how to respond, how to adapt, and how to mitigate. It was really pretty striking yesterday at our breakout session on um, global consequences of a warming Arctic that um, uh, the, um, I'll just give an example here, that um, you know, if we, we talk about wanting to stay within two degrees and we know that uh, if we, uh, uh, we can burn about, uh, produce about 275 billion more tons of carbon in the atmosphere and more or less have a 50% chance of staying within that limit. That does not take into account the additional emissions that will come from thawing permafrost and the release of carbon dioxide and methane. If that's included, the figure that was given yesterday is the total release of that, those emissions, if we're on the same track we're on now, by 2100 will be about equal to what the US will, is emitting every year right now. So we would basically we're not going to stay at two degrees if we get these feedbacks. We need to understand that and therefore have a, <clears throat> a greater sense of both urgency and creativity in the policy world and the action world and the actions being taken by private corporations and by subnational um, governments and cities. So the, the, um, the science on the science is important, but we should also be doing some research 
on the social dimensions. What are the implications of these changes? And what are the opportunities for addressing the consequences of those changes? We need to look at the have research on the competing resource development options. Our fish, when the ice all melts and uh, the Arctic Ocean becomes a, a great, uh, the, the, the last great new fishery on Earth, um, how will that interact with other forms of development, whether it's oil and gas or minerals or, or uh, any other um, um, resource extraction that we can imagine? Are those compatible? Uh, is the continued addition of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere that's changing the acidity of the oceans, how is that going to affect the productivity of the Arctic Ocean? We don't know because we're, we've heard that the warming of the Arctic will make it more productive. Unfortunately, the rest of the oceans in the world are in declining productivity, in part because of acidification, because of warming, because of all the pollution that occurs there. Let's take a lesson from what we've done in the past and hopefully <clears throat> have the scientific basis to do better in the Arctic in the future. Another thing I'd like to just mention is uh, it has come up in, in bits and pieces here. I just want to kind of pull those together. <clears throat> and that's the need for coordination of research. I don't mean in a sense of directing research in some high level position. As one colleague of mine says, we cannot we cannot run the world from, 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 in a UN sense from New York and Geneva. Uh, things have to come from the regions, uh, but it is very important that we have coordination. We have limited resources to even do the research, as urgent as it is. And so we wanna make sure that we cover all the bases, that there's enough coordination among the, the, the government-sponsored research, the privately-sponsored research, the university research, the, the individual research institutes, uh, that we are really covering the basis. Now, no one of us can keep track of that, but maybe someone should. I mean, there is the Arctic portal. I build on things we have. There is the Arctic portal, which provides a, a great entry on the internet to finding out what's going on in the Arctic. Let's use that. There is the University of the Arctic, a virtual university that's been created in, in Norway. Uh, let's build on that. Uh, let's uh, build on all of these things. And I was delighted to hear Fran Ulmer say, I was going to just say, well, this is what the Arctic Council should do, but she announced just in the previous, uh, this, uh, this morning, that in fact the Arctic Council is, a year, is within a year of having such a plan in place, which I applaud. I think it's absolutely uh, essential. Let's learn from <clears throat> past things like the polar year and so forth, how we might do this cooperation and coordination uh, better. Um, let me just close by saying that um, I, I'm a veteran of the ozone wars. I um, uh, happened to be working in the U.S. Senate when uh, the, this, this issue of, um, of, of ozone depletion arose. In the U.S. it was characterized as, it always came out as, two California scientists say we are depleting the ozone layer. Now you're all giggling because that carries a connotation. Who can take California scientists seriously, right? I mean, they're in California, for heaven's sakes. Uh, but it turned out to be serious, and uh, one of the amazing things that happened, that research uh, was first reported in 1973, published in 1974, and by 1977, there was a law in the United States that eliminated all chlorofluorocarbons in spray cans. There were several Nordic countries that joined unilaterally. Canada, I believe, joined or just didn't join, did it separately. And that's 10 years before the Montreal Protocol. Montreal Protocol has been the most successful international treaty I know of. And it is based on science, and things continued in terms of their scientific, um, uh, based on the science, and we are really nearing a really uh, successful uh, conclusion. And finally, let me just say that collaboration among nations will lead to cooperation, and despite the tensions that occur between and among nations around the world, I'm pleased to see that in the Arctic, that seems to be missing, and there is a focus on cooperation rather than conflict. Thank you.